Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I have the pleasure now of presenting to you one of the messes that I've made that I like to call crash and burn because it was just one mess after another after another. And hopefully you can see how uh, a systematic approach to analysis of these things can help learn from the complication and make us better operators. My disclosures. So this was a 58-year-old with dyspnea, had previous coronary artery disease that was stented and had known hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Septal ablation three months prior was very successful. He went with a provocable gradient of 80 millimeters of mercury down to a provocable gradient of less than 10 after a successful single ablation. So clearly this is a guy who had a good result following an indicated procedure. We tend to be hammers sometimes with nails. And so if, if somebody comes back with chest pain, then the immediate first thought is, well, we have to do an angiogram again, right? And sometimes it's more than just an angiogram. So he'd had a symptomatic episode of VT, had an ICD, and then he comes back with shortness of breath that was slowly worsening. A repeat echo from an outside cardiologist showed a new LVOT gradient to 40, up to 60 with Valsalva. And he was referred at the time for repeat septal ablation, even though we hadn't really done the echo ourselves. And one of the things that we do at our center is specialize in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is the baseline angiogram that he had come with prior. Right? You can see that really large S1 that was the target for his septal ablation the first time. This is the RCA. Oops, sorry. Okay. And this is the original septal ablation procedure, wire into the septal, balloon goes up, alcohol ablation through the inflated, inflated balloon, uh, through a variety of accesses, and things went very well. Right? We were quite, quite pleased with that. So when bringing him back expecting to have to re-ablate at least a part of his septum, we went in with the appropriate accesses ready to do what we needed to do. We had a left femoral venous line that was a seven French for a Swangans catheter to determine the cardiac output. We had a left femoral arterial access with a five French end hole pigtail in the LV so that we could get an, a constant LV pressure. And then we had the right femoral artery that we expected to use for our, uh, our procedure, right? The, one end of the pigtail was connected to one transducer and then the sheath in the femoral was connected as the aortic pressure to the other transducer. Sort of a quick and dirty way because we didn't have a Langston catheter available at the time. So there's our initial hemodynamics, right? Very nice aortic pressure on top of an LV pressure. There's nothing particularly special here. And then we induce a PVC to look for a Brockenbrough brunwald moreau sign of post-PVC augmentation. And what do we see? Nothing, right? Looks pretty good. So we probably should have repeated that echo before we took him onto the table, but we believed the pictures that we saw, and we tested the hemodynamics, and there really wasn't anything around. So there was no gradient with provoked PVCs. There was no gradient with Valsalva. We repeated the echo on the table. There was no real gradient appreciated there. So maybe his heart was hyperdynamic at the time. Maybe he was unwell. Maybe he was very dry. Who knows, right? And so we figured, well, okay, he's here for shortness of breath anyway. It's, it's just a diagnostic. We'll quickly shoot the coronaries, get in, get out. So we took the pigtail out, we exchanged it for a JL diagnostic catheter, recognizing that we still had the, the uh, right groin access that was available, but decided not to use that for whatever reason. And then when we put the JL in, our usual practice is, you know, in usual in interventional cardiology, we're always trying to fix safety, right? So you bleed back the catheter to make sure you have flow. One of the things that I do when we engage anything is I actually have a little 10 cc syringe on the table and I suck back because I don't, on the off chance that I'm not getting flow backwards, I don't want to move the catheter without negative pressure on the end in case that is indeed a thrombus. Because if I move the catheter with the negative pressure on the end and it's a thrombus, I can at minimum pull it out of the heart and out of the way of the head and neck vessels so that we can deal with it. So we did not inject through the catheter. But very shortly after engaging the catheter, not being able to suck back, this was the pressure. So you can see this sort of terrible looking sail ST segments across the, the ECG with this dramatic drop in his blood pressure to a systolic of about 65. So what's the problem? Right? This is not a difficult thing to surmise. We've either dissected the left main or thrombosed the left main. So he starts complaining of severe chest pain, immediately take the JL out, flush the G's, drop 10,000 of heparin and go in with an EBU guide with the ex expectation of fixing something. And now he becomes unresponsive. So now we have a big problem. 
right? You can see that there's no pulsatility left in that art line tracing on either side. And so now we've decided, forget fixing the left main, we need to get him onto some sort of hemodynamic support to manage his, his cardiac arrest and then deal. This was all a witnessed phenomenon. So this is his first angiogram. So that is not a happy heart, right? There's a big, giant, ugly thrombus sitting in the left main. Clearly was attached to a tubular thrombus, probably picked up from the sheath attached to the JL catheter that just moved right off of the catheter as we pulled. So we quickly placed a wire down the LAD. At the same time, the contralateral access on the other side was upsized for support placement, started CPR, started cardioversion for VFib three times, and then addressed the, uh, the left main as quickly as possible. We had an impella that was easily set up in our lab. We had already called for the perfusionist because we expected we would need ECMO, but that was gonna take some time to prime the pump. So we quickly put in an impella and did several runs of aspiration thrombectomy in the left main and LAD. And this was after that. So this is better. There's flow now down the left system. You can see that the heart is beating. That is clearly an improvement from where we were before, so we're winning. But the circ is out. So after we put in the impella and the aspiration, he still remains very, very sick. He's still not doing very, very well. So at this point, the decision is made, now that the perfusionist has arrived, to stop the intervention further because now we've only been about 30 minutes in. So that circ is still a viable territory. Let's get this person on hemodynamic support beyond the impella, right? This is somebody who's got effectively no functioning heart, um, uh, no functioning heart output, so he's a classical patient for ECMO. And so we quickly cannulated the patient for ECMO. And I mean, we've always talked about what happens in PCI, right? Emergency PCI is fun. Complex PCI is fun. Emergency complex PCI can get kind of dicey. So in this case, the access was done as quickly as possible. A Lunderquist wire was used because this man is not a small man. And so we needed a relatively supportive wire to place the 21 French ECMO cannula in his left common femoral vein, or his left common femoral artery, because this was a large man, so he needed full arterial access. And then radial access was obtained to be able to do the procedure. So we addressed, we gave up the femoral wire position, 21 French arterial in the left groin, 25 in the venous in the right. And there we go. We don't have much in the way of pulsatility, but we do have a mean arterial pressure of 100. And his STs are now starting to come down because we've unloaded his heart. So his oxygen demand has come down very nicely. So we quickly checked the RCA from the radial route. The impella is now at minimum just to vent him. And then we turn our attention back to the left system, okay? And we address all of that thrombus. We end up rewiring, doing thrombosuction and, and rheolytic thrombectomy, so angiojet of the circumflex system into the left main. The angiojet, I don't know, for those of you who are, are not familiar with it, is a rheolytic thrombectomy system where it basically sprays blood at a thrombus, pulverizes, and then quickly sucks it back into the catheter. So you, it's, it almost sounds like a washing machine where it's back and forth, but it removes the thrombus. And it's very effective in the legs. In the heart, it kind of comes with bradycardia from time to time, so you have to be careful, but in this case, we're on ECMO, so we don't care. And we actually managed to get a lot of flow back, right? So now the circ is starting to open up. The LAD is starting to open up. We're doing much, much better. And this is what I thought of myself at the time. I'm awesome, right? I've saved this man's life. I've pulled him out of the fire. I'm feeling really, really good. And then there is badness. We all know that the battle is won and lost at the access. And so he starts now profusely bleeding around the femoral sheath. This is the impella sheath. I look at the impella sheath carefully, and we see that there is a tear in the common femoral artery just above the impella sheath, partly because the sheath is a little bit cracked inside the common femoral. So this is not good now. We've lost at least two units of blood. His ECMO is now starting to chatter. Right, so we start now transfusing him, praying that he's not gonna thrombose his coronaries again. And then we check the heparin and realize that the heparin's only borderline, so we give him more heparin, which then makes his leg bleed some more. You see where this is going. And so after the cut down, where we get control of the left femoral bleed, we see this. We go, I don't understand. He's on ECMO and impella to vent the LV and his coronaries are open. I literally looked at this man's groin and said, explain yourself. This doesn't make any sense, right? So we executed a massive resuscitation, several units of packed red cells, vasopressors, liters of fluid, etc., and then took some uh, femoral arteriograms. So unfortunately, it says it can't play media here. Um, what this demonstrated was that there was a little arterial injury, but it was fixed. 
okay? And then when we filled him up, right, we give him lots and lots and lots of blood, we actually start to get his pulsatility back. The ECMO started to support him again, right? So the issue here was we were, we were out of volume, so we fixed the volume. But then he goes to the CCU and he does it again. And what's worse now, his bladder pressure goes up to 22. So he is developing an abdominal compartment syndrome. <laughs> So we're asking ourselves now, where is this coming from? And we realize that we actually, when we put in the venous cannula for the ECMO, remember I I'd mentioned that there was a little bit of resistance and some concern about the wire position. Well, I tore his IVC with the ECMO cannula, right? So that's a frustrating situation. So we then got vascular surgery involved, did an emergent bedside laparotomy. Thankfully, there was an area of injury in the IVC that was covered with thrombus and so he wasn't bleeding anymore. So we were able to close his belly. He had a large right-sided retroperitoneal hematoma that was treated conservatively at the time. So how do we get better from this, right? Like what a train wreck. It's a disaster all from a angiogram. So when we do systematic analysis, we do this in our cath labs, in our practices every day, right? We hold M&M rounds, for example, morbidity and mortality rounds. We hold case discussions. We hold seminars like these where we systematically analyze complications. But there are re where we analyze things, but there isn't really a good framework that we can use to analyze complications. So this is a framework that I came up with a while ago that I use in my own practice and something that we're writing up to publish. It's called the petals approach. Number one is what is the predictability of the complication that you've had in the context of your case? So if you had a big perforation, did you have a giant calcified nodule that you didn't image? And so you then took a balloon up high, no surprise, you perfed. Was it predictable? That's the data that we get from the big studies. E is the event prior to the event that caused the complication. So for this, it was, why did I choose to do the angiogram when I had good evidence that the reason I came for was not the problem? Why did I do that? I'll be done in just two seconds here. T is the treatment that was employed and the outcome that was achieved, right? So this is just the usual stuff that we learn about how do you deal with complication X or complication Y. A is the advice for your next case. So how do you change your environment? How do you change the cath lab to systematically prevent one or several of these complications? For example, micropuncture access using an ultrasound, even in emergencies to make sure that your femoral artery doesn't tear. You know, making sure you see the end of a wire on fluoroscopy at all times, particularly if it's a stiff wire so you don't tear the IVC. L is the life lesson learned. What am I going to do to change my practice to make this better? The last, that was the, f the last time I ever did a, quote, unnecessary, you know, left coronary system shot while I happen to be in there for another reason, because this is what can happen. And then S is important. This is the support of your peers. This is peer review. This is where you have to take this case, and you have to be able to be honest about the complication you've had. Discuss it with your peers and figure out if they have any ideas of how to make their own practice better, as well as yours. That's a really important piece to this. And so my pedals analysis of this was, this was not predictable. It was unexpected. We didn't know this, right? It was probably from the sheath. The event before the event was, I was still trying to figure out why the echo had a gradient from outside and we had no gradient here. So I wasn't paying attention to the switch over to the coronary intervention. And so when my fellow then put a, a, microcath or sorry, a diagnostic catheter up, I didn't watch him. That's on me. It's my patient. It's my case. The treatment was impella early, ECMO early. Both were good decisions, right? Aggressive resuscitation, calling anesthesia, calling the people from the CCU to help with the resuscitation. Again, good decisions. But vascular access could have been done differently. And as a result, we have changed the way we do vascular access, whether it's an emergency or not. A, always, 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 always flush the sheath, right? I've, we've changed the scrub tech protocol now so that there are always saline injections on top of the patient so that you never have to reach back far. It becomes a procedural memory thing to make sure the sheaths are clear every time a catheter is exchanged. Your L, your life lesson is never lose, fo lose focus. Don't ever let anybody interrupt you. If you're in the middle of an acute resuscitation, get someone else, one of your partners into the room and get them to scrub so they can stand beside you. So that even if they're there for moral support, they're keeping their eye on these little things so that you don't have to. You can think about the bigger picture. And then S is, of course, I called for help, right? I called my CV surgical partners. I called all of these people in. I called the vascular surgeons to do the cut down. And when, I, when we were done, their response was, I'm glad you called. This brought us closer as a team because ultimately, this guy got better. 
He came off after four days from ECMO. His mental status returned to normal. He was discharged three weeks later with a completely normal EF, and he walked into clinic a month later. So crash and burn, is, it, it's a difficult experience for anybody. But ultimately, if you use a systematic analysis to analyze, systematic approach to analyze your complications, you end up a better operator because of them. The only way to avoid these things is to not do cases, right? And that's just not what we do. Thanks very much. Thank you.